Hello and welcome to Tile Capes, where we cover film, television, comics, and games. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Hill. What's going on, guys? This week, Denis Villeneuve brings Dune back to cinemas. Paul Atreides unites with Chani and the Fremen while seeking revenge against the conspirators who destroyed his family. Facing a choice between the love of his life and the fate of the universe, he must prevent a terrible future only he can foresee. Dune Part 2 is finally here. Is it just another run-of-the-mill science fiction film or a masterpiece of the genre? So, Todd, which is it? I'm going to go the latter. I think this is a masterpiece of the genre. I completely agree with you. So let's uh, let's talk non-spoilers first. So give us your non-spoilers uh, kind of first impressions and take on Dune Part 2. Uh, I thought this movie was amazing. Uh, it's like a, it's a technical and visual masterpiece. If you have not picked up part one, I definitely would recommend you go pick up part one, watch it. Uh, go support this movie, watch part two. Uh, there's an outside chance we get a part three. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So uh, definitely go check it out. Yeah, I completely agree again with you. I think uh, this is one of those films, like you see a lot of the, these new release films, and everybody goes to the premiere, and the hype is high, and everybody's tweeting like, oh, my God, you know, I came in my pants. It's so <laughs> it's so good kind of thing. Right. But this is one of those films that actually lived up to the hype. Well, I kind of, There's a kind of a question I'll throw at you later that's, uh, you know, we're hearing a lot of, like, when you when you look at the reviews of this film or like some of the, the hype around it, it's uh, it's the Empire Strikes Back. Oh of, lord of the Dune universe, okay. which we'll talk about that a little later on. But like, yeah, I would say if you if you haven't seen the film and you're watching this, uh, you know, pause this now, come back to us, go see this film. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It's uh, it's visually stunning. It's narratively it, it's it's deep. It's depthful. It leaves you kind of thinking about some of the bigger questions that are kind of left lingering. Some of the things that you may get in a part three, like it's just this is what film should be, and films like this should be supported. People should go see them. This deserves to make a billion dollars, unlike other things that have unfortunately made billions of dollars that right. have, have sequels and continue getting made. I mean, my God, we have what eleven now coming up, Fast and the Furious movies. Oh Lord, yeah, you know. So <laughs> like, this is a film that should be supported. This is real filmmaking. This is real acting. This is like this is a master piece of the the science fiction genre this is damn near a perfect film so i can't recommend it highly enough go out and see dune part two for sure if you haven't it's definitely worth your time and your money oh yeah uh ready to move on to spoilers todd let's do it all right so dune part two spoilers are ahead we're going to try to take you through the story a little bit here as we go it's a almost three hour film so we might not hit everything but we're going to try to go in as in-depth as possible here so todd you want to kind of pick us up where our story begins here so we kind of open with uh princess arulan i think i got that right (laughs) nailed it she gives us her opening narration uh where she kind of talks about the liquidation of the house and uh you know family of tradies kind of how that's affected her and her father right and then uh we kind of see we get a little narration by paul too he has like uh he kind of narrates and kind of talks to his sister in the womb a little bit yeah he says you know father is dead shouldn't you go back you know among the stars that kind of thing Mm -hmm. like uh they're on their way back to uh the fremen so we kind of pick up right at the end of where dune one kind of left off it's like uh, they're heading to Siege Tabor. They've still got the body of poor Jamis. <laughs> they're still dragging him through the desert after Paul killed him at the end of uh, Doom Part 1. Um, they're, they're they're being trailed by a platoon of Harkonnen, and we kind of see that uh, the Fremen use a kind of a thumper to call some worms. And I really I really like the technology that the Harkonnen have, like that the, the technology, I guess, that's kind of like reminiscent of what the Baron uses to – Haul his fat ass up and down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like this, I guess they're called suspensors. I'm not really sure, but you kind of see them like ascend up the rocks. And like that whole opening scene really just kind of drew me in. Like the way it looks, it's got that kind of, kind of very desert palette, that very kind of like dark orange, like kind of tint to like the, the, the cinematography. And like uh, even the, the little fight, it's not really a fight. The, the Fremen take them out like super easy, but like the way their weapons kind of fire, like you kind of see these like very quick like energy beams that are yeah. kind of fired across the desert. And like, I just really, I love the whole thing. Like, it's just, I don't know. It's fantastic. to Right. Me. So we kind of see, uh, lady Jessica gets a little bit, I uh, guess overcome, uh, cause it's the, uh, Freeman actually uses uh, water harvesting device. Oh yeah. They take the, uh, 
uh, water from the uh, the dead Harkonnens' bodies. Yes. And, you know, he kind of mentions this to Paul, you know, this water is not drinkable because it's just too many chemicals in their bodies, but we can use it for our steel suits. Yeah. And I guess Lady Jessica has a little bit of uh, sickness, maybe combined with morning sickness because she's got the baby. But uh, he's like, no, don't, don't, don't vomit. Yeah, don't, don't waste don't that. Don't let it out. <laughs> yeah, don't let it out. And we see, too, like yeah, it was kind of a, you know, something, a little bit of piece of world building. It's like, how do you get rid of the bodies of uh, the dead Harkonnen? So they also set a thumper. They pile their bodies up in a in a big pile. They set a thumper up and let the, the worms kind of come and uh, swallow yeah. whole. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, Raban here in this film. So Dave Bautista plays Raban in the in the first film. He's back in this one. Like he's on his like back foot. It feels to me like the whole film. Like uh, he's like he's losing. Uh, you know, he's losing his foothold on the rockets. Like Paul uh, is, as we see, he's going to go through the, the film and try to disrupt the spice trade and everything else. But like, he's already kind of on his back foot. And like, how do you feel about the way his character is kind of depicted in this, like versus film one to now like film two? Yes, like you say, he's kind of he's backpedaling the whole time. You know, he's you know he's kind of we'll just say cocked this whole thing up. Right. <laughs> the Baron put him in charge of you know going back here and reestablishing the spice trade, getting everything going back. And you know he's just he's cocked it up bad. Yeah. Takes it out on his uh, you know his uh, helpers, you know his his crew. He's exactly. more of a badass to him than he is to anybody else. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. It's like uh, he's like he's like in this film. He's just a tough guy with his subordinates, like not with anyone that can pose a real challenge to him. It's like, uh, and that's kind of like a theme that we'll see. I think for the Harkonnen, like. He's that way with his subordinates. There's a little scene later where Baron Harkonnen is like, I think he kills two random like helper girls he has. Yeah. And Fade does that same kind of bullshit. They're just like tough guys with their subordinates, but anybody that can offer them a real fight, they're kind of like we're kind of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for for lack of a better word, they're just kind of like bitches. But yeah, they do kind of like set up uh, Raban here. He's kind of like this set up in the first film. He's like kind of like this badass, and this is like. He's just like he. Pl he's like it's like all the Harkonnen are playing the tough guys until you like stand up to them. Like if they're not like using their money and influence and like overwhelming force, it's yeah. like you can easily back them down in like a one on one kind of confrontation. True, true. Uh, we go to Siege Tabor and uh, there's kind of like a split between, and that's a theme of the films. Like there's a split between. Uh, those, those that believe Paul is the Lisan Agaib and those that don't, like, they think that maybe, maybe he's just, like, an outsider spy coming in. And then there's, like, a lot of that, like, there's also people that are kind of angry that he killed, he killed uh, Jamas. True. So, like, you kind of see he's not he's not warmly welcomed by, by all. He's warmly welcomed by some. And that's kind of like a theme that you see in the film is, like, um, is it's the fundamentalists, the believers, mostly kind of depicted it being in the south regions of Arrakis versus kind of the, those in the north that are kind of more like believers in Fremen being the savior of mm -hmm. Arrakis and not some outsider, like, you know, kind of white savior, I guess, coming in to, right. like, you know, rescue their village or anything like that. Like, it's a it's a theme that you kind of see played out through the, the whole film. I think it works. And it kind of seemed to me, too, that it was more like it was more of the older generation that believed in the prophecy Not and it was younger. more of your younger generations like nah this is ours to do yeah i didn't really even think about that but yeah you're absolutely right because it's like chani and her little like her other female friend that kind of like breaks paul's balls through most of the film like <laughs> right. they're, they're kind of that younger generation that does seem a little bit like yeah we're not sure about this like savior prophecy or not or anything else like that you know so so we kind of see uh stilgar he kind of has a meeting with like the village leadership and you know he's trying you know tell them you know hey this guy's the one <laughs> and they're like you know we're not really convinced of that you know the desert will decide his fate <laughs> yeah so we see uh we'll kind of go through the through these a little bit too before we get to his just trials like paul's like training like uh he kind of he's talking to to, to to jessica and it's kind of those uh kind of the same things uh the themes we talked about a little bit in the first film is like that benny jesuit propaganda oh yeah paul still sees it at that the prophecy is that it's just like they the benny jesuit have kind of place that amongst these people that have kind of been um not enslaved but have kind of been downtrodden their entire existence and like under the thumb of these bigger like rulers like you know these this the the imperium and things like that and like paul still sees it as like this prophecy has been something that's been kind of implanted by the the benny Gesserit, but he kind of does admit that he has to kind of use the prophecy a little bit to kind of convince those non-believers to kind of follow him that so he can uh you know get to where he can disrupt the spice production because that's the only way that the uh, the old emperor is going to come down and uh, 
I guess, have any kind of talks with him, right? Or give him the chance to assassinate him or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, we uh, we see kind of Paul's uh, uh, training. Um, there's one other thing I should mention before that because it, it does kind of come back a little bit. So Stilgar, we kind of see her, uh, him and Jessica. They're having a little scene by in, in the siege. Like, uh, it's kind of like we saw in the Dune 84 film. Like it's the first time we see it here. Like there's a bunch of water on Arrakis, right. which is it is a, it's like the, a sacred well where the water from dead Fremen is kind of returned back into that kind of well of water. And he kind of explains that to, to Jessica. And he says, you know, someone would rather die of thirst and drink this water like it's it's sacred water mm-hmm. like i just imagine some like random fremen on the side <laughs> when he's saying that with like a straw I'm like, well, we what's supposed, that? we're not supposed to oh sacred oh. you say <laughs> let me just tuck, let me just tuck that away but uh yeah so he he also presents uh jessica the choice to basically you become the reverend mother or we're gonna have to put your water in here if you know what i'm saying <laughs> wink wink you know pretty right. much so, you got two choices yeah exactly <laughs> so uh uh we go to kind of Paul, his kind of training. So uh, uh, his trials are he, the, the first thing he starts off with is kind of like the um, uh, it's just basically going from point A to point B. It's yeah. like go from uh, cross this part of the desert. If you survive this, this is kind of training part one done. Uh, where does uh, while Paul is off doing his training, talk about Jessica and uh, what goes on with her becoming the Reverend Mother Todd. So to become the Reverend Mother, she has to drink what is known as the water of life. And she's kind of put before what is their, I guess, still current Reverend Mother. She's, you know, she's ready to go at any time. She's yeah. really ancient. Yeah. And it so looks the, like she's like old, blind, maybe. Yeah. Her, her vision's gone, and they, you know, they, you know, Jessica drinks the water, and you know, she kind of, uh, you, you know, you think she's going to die because they say this stuff is poisonous, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, she makes it. But then right after that, you now before the older rather than mother passes, she's like, "Oh no, what have we done? This lady was pregnant," mm-hmm. and you kind of see that like uh, the the water of life kind of infusing with like her unborn baby. Right. She immediately starts having the blue eyes, like, and she's she's the new rather mother, and then kind of outside that, like Paul, uh, Paul's there, uh, Stilgar, Chani, and they're like. Um, Stilgar is convinced that because she survived it, it's part of the prophecy. I think the prophecy says the mother of the Lisan Agaib will uh, shall survive the holy poison. So again, he's like a fundamentalist. He's a believer. He's mm-hmm. of that older generation. So he's like, oh, she's she's the mother of our savior. Like she survived the poison. And Paul's like, no, it, it's not a miracle. Like uh, the uh, the advanced level Benny Jesuit, they're able to like uh, do poison transmutation. So again, he's like f- still fighting against that still trying to explain this is guys come on it's just is, me i'm just here to help you she's just yeah i'm just i just want to learn your ways i want to fight beside you i'm, I'm no not messiah your, <laughs> i'm not your savior i'm not the christ figure my mother is a Benny jesuit she knows these advanced techniques for poison transmutation like it's it, it's fine guys like she, she she just knows how to do this like yeah. no, let's not read too much into this you know what i mean and for me once she becomes that high mother or reverend mother Mm -hmm. it's like she's she's full-blown you know we got to get paul recognizes what he is she starts spreading those seeds like immediately she almost to me kind of almost when i was watching it felt like she turned almost evil in a way yeah kind of that's like you know i kind of want to get to like some of that because like we definitely in this in with her changing into the reverend mother after taking the water of life and then later on paul takes the water of life and we'll kind of talk about the change that like kind of sparks in him but yeah i kind of i agree with you it's like even if she's not out and out evil it's like she definitely it definitely changes her personality it definitely adds like a um uh, emphasis on we have to because she then she starts being able to kind of commune to her unborn baby like the baby kind of talks to her they mm-hmm. kind of speak back and forth to each other and that seems a little like nefarious just the way that kind of relationship is and how much they push the savior but like yeah there's a scene where she's Jessica is like you know we have to uh, her, she's talking to the baby and it's like we have to uh, further the prophecy we have to convert the non-believers we have to make sure that we're going to start with the weak ones the ones that are vulnerable the ones that fear me yeah. that kind of thing like she does take on like a whole kind of a new personality like just to kind of mention it too like uh with her character in case i forget about it like i just really like the kind of the physical look that she has later like she has this like 
it's almost like Benny Jesuit meets Fremen, like the look of her, like mm-hmm. the with like the 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 markings on her face, and like the Benny Jesuit cover. And like I really like the way that, that she looks in the film later on. But like you said, she definitely has like a change in her kind of like personality for sure. And you know, my initial thought on that was like, you know, hey man, she's she's turning rogue here. She's she's a, she's bad. But then I thought back to part one. You know, when she had what was basically her last interaction with uh, the Duke. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, I need you to promise me you're going to take care of Paul. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, I'm not talking about it as his mother. I'm talking about it as a Benny Jesuit. Mm -hmm. So as soon as she reaches her top form in that, she's, you know, that's what she does. Yeah, and that's (laughs) kind of a thing in this movie is like, uh, it's like Paul kind of levels up. She kind of levels Mm -hmm. up, you know. and And then I think you're right. Like, that's probably is her way of like... Uh, above all else, making sure to protect Paul and protect her family and uh, to uh, kind of further, I don't think she's furthering the, the, the beliefs or the, uh, I don't think she's furthering the cause of the Benny Jesuit. I think she's furthering the cause of keeping her son alive mostly. Yeah. And she's willing to do just about anything to make sure that that's accomplished. Uh, speaking of two, where we were talking about Paul um, saying, you know, I'm not the savior. You know, mom knows how to uh, transmutate poison. Mm-hmm. Uh, immediately that cuts to a scene of Stilgar with some of the older guys. But, like, he he's definitely the savior. <laughs> he's too humble to say he's the savior. He's definitely the savior. Like, that kind yeah. of thing. Like, it's just. There's a little bit. I mean, it's not much. There's a little bit of little light, light moments kind of sprinkled in. Mostly I'm, around. I wouldn't call it comedy yeah. per se. but <laughs> there, There's definitely. You get a few chuckles, and it's mostly. Mm-hmm. comes from like that kind of it mostly comes from Stilgar mostly comes from Javier Bardem's character and like his just unwavering belief in Paul and like what he's willing to do and like just you know just some of those like little moments where he's like oh he's too humble he's definitely (laughs) he why would he not say of course he's gonna say he's not the savior he's too humble to admit that he's the savior kind of thing so you know uh but back to Paul's training like I said the the he he's got a call across the desert from point eight Point B, Chani kind of helps him accomplish that. She kind of teaches him like the kind of the proper way to sand walk. She says he, you know, his sand walk is basically for shit, pretty much. <laughs> uh, she kind of teaches him more about uh, more about the ways of the Fremen, the kind of the devices they use to survive. And uh, you kind of see their seeds of romance are kind of like yeah, plant, finally top. here. Yeah, they're kind of they're definitely uh, those seeds are kind of planted. Um, and uh, they there's another scene if you want to take us through the uh, the spice harvester attack Todd that's kind of the next big thing we see with Paul and Chani yeah that's an incredible scene uh, you know there's a spice harvester coming in to harvest the spice you know the Fremen decide to put run an attack on it uh, there's that one where I think uh, Chani was getting ready to fire a missile at an ornithopter <laughs> Or, you know, did I say that wrong? Hey. <laughs> ornithopter, yeah. Thopter. Orna, 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 yeah. Ornithopter. Yeah, the dragonfly copter. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. And so she's got her missile trained on it, but there's a Harkonnen getting ready to take her from behind. And, you know, mm. you think maybe she might drop the rocket. <laughs> right. You know, but, uh, you know, she just swoops around, just blows, just him, turns. blows him to shit with that yeah. thing. It's very much like straight out of a video game. Like, that's a yeah. movie. Like, when some, some, like, you know, enemy character's running at you and you've got a rocket launcher, what do you do? Put that down and attack them, like, in single combat? No. no you just blow them to hell you and maybe them, you yeah. sail. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I love that that scene though. Like, I don't, I don't think I remember like an action scene that kind of felt and was filmed that way. Like, just from like the way like the the surprise attack he is, and like the the ornithopter is kind of like blasting down with its kind of like Gatlin gun kind of cannon. Oh yeah, and it's not just like single fire like rounds. It's like it's almost like it's like. It's like got this like large kind of dispersal pattern, like it's like stamping the ground with with bullets or like mm-hmm. energy beams. Like it just looks, you know, visually kind of distinct, like something you, you haven't really seen before. But like that whole scene, like they're like they're they're like scuttling underneath the harvester when they're getting like a bunch of Fremen get taken out, a bunch of them get killed. Mm-hmm. And it's like I don't I don't really remember seeing like an action scene kind of filmed that way. Like everything in this film, like these like big major scenes, like they have such a, a style to them that you don't really see in a lot of other films it's not like you look at it and it's like okay well i know how this is going to play out or like i've seen this a thousand times in any kind of action movie like it's like to me like it elevates like the genre a little bit like what you're used to in a science fiction film and even like action films or anything this would hold up with any other action film out there like it's not an action film but like the, the action in this is done well enough and like it it could hold up against any other film you kind of put it up against i would say 
So uh, after the uh, the attack on the uh, harvester, you know, they're kind of celebrating it. And I think this is where Paul finally gets his, let me try this pronunciation, <laughs> Fedekin name? Fedekin. Fedekin? You're close. Okay. Yeah, Fedekin. <laughs> Fedekin, yeah. Uh, I think his uh, last name is Usul, which yeah. means the base of the pillar. Yeah, so basically he gets to take his Fedekin name. So that's Usul, the base of the pillar. He gets to choose his, they, t- they tell him he gets to choose his war name. So he chooses the the name of the, uh, the little kangaroo mouse, mm-hmm. uh, which is uh, Muadib. And uh, that kind of translates into the one who points the way. Um we were talking before the movie. I just made some kind of comment that I just kept remembering when I was like thinking about going back through this film. Is like, what are your expectations? What do you want to see out of this film? And you're like, I want to see that little mouse ride a worm. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert: that doesn't happen. Unfortunately, the the kangaroo mouse Muadib does not ride a worm. The actual uh, the war named Muadib does, yes. but not the little mouse. Um, but yeah, you get more Chani, more Paul. They're kind of their their romance. You get their their first little kiss on the dune. Yes, they have a they have a private moment where uh, she kind of uh, he tells Chani about a vision of him, uh, and this is kind of a, a vision that kind of comes up several times. Uh, it's a vision of him in the south following someone that triggers a holy war, and the kind of that person that you see is definitely obviously depicted as a woman. Yeah, and you can't really see exactly who it is. And at first, I'm kind of thinking, okay, well, is that his mother? Could it be Princess uh, uh, the Princess? I can't remember what her name is. Um, or, you know, is it someone, maybe it's Chani? Like, we don't really mm-hmm. know. Like, you get kind of an inference that it might be more of his mother, which we'll kind of get into a little bit uh, later on. But um, Paul's next task is uh, riding the worm, Todd. Riding the worm. Yeah, talk about the worms. So, uh, you know, uh, they're kind of out there. They're watching him. Paul's getting ready to go out and ride the worm. And I think Chani's friends got to give him hell, like, you know. Hey, you know, don't pick a small one. Pick yeah. a big one. Yeah, don't embarrass us, numb nuts. Yeah, so what's he do? Thing. Like summon the biggest one out there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> probably the one that's probably on that like uh, yeah. that mural. The you know the, the old man of the desert. I don't know if that's the granddaddy of all yeah, worms. Exactly, like the biggest worm out there. And like you know, you see Stilgar getting that little comedy moment. It's like, no, not not one that big. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Yeah, but of oh. course, uh, Paul rides it like a champ because you know, hey. He's the one, baby. <laughs> yeah, all the all the worm riding scenes like are really, really like really good. Like you can see like a lot of work went into them to make sure they like they looked good on film, not not like you know something you saw in the the eighty four Dune. Thing. Yeah, I think uh, you may have said in our part one, or I had read somewhere that they took a, a long time on that worm tech or how they wanted the worms oh, to the look. look of them. Yeah, and then and even this one too, like with the worm riding, I'm pretty sure that I read like that. There's a lot of that stuff that's done practically in terms of, like they built like you know a, a back of that worm to like where people can like stand on them, they can kind of drag them through the desert kind of thing. Like you see, like a lot of work went in to make sure that it wasn't like goofy or schlocky or some anything. kind of green screen blue screen mess yeah exactly yeah. like you know yeah exactly like something like that so yeah like it all the worm riding stuff is like is fantastic and the look of the worms like we talked about in part one is just completely on point but uh you know that you see that the more paul kind of accomplishes the easier it is for jessica to kind of go and like sow that belief in him little by little in the north so she's kind of got to the point where she's got these like followers of her too that are helping her like her little minions that kind of go out her little Mm -hmm. birds that kind of go out and help spread the word like they tell her oh you know paul's ridden the worm well that's that's another part of the prophecy like you know that's something else we can use in this propaganda machine um so she decides to turn herself uh and her her efforts to the south to the fundamentalists you got to get those on board to get all the Fremen's fully kind of invested. Um, and uh, we see Paul and Chani, they got they finally have a little sexy time. Oh, yeah, a little sexy time action. He promised her, uh, it'll, it comes up several times, but he promises to be with her as long as he breathes. Uh, before you see Jessica kind of depart and go uh, go head for the south, they have like kind of a kind of an argument again. More that you know he's mad at her for kind of spreading the pop- propaganda all around. Uh, you know Paul still doesn't want to acknowledge that the prophecy is, is real, you know at all. And they just they have it's a part in that trailer where she's like you know we're giving them hope, and he's like that's not hope, you yeah, know, that kind of thing. Just like really again more character development, more world building, that kind of stuff. Like it's all it's all really good stuff. 
So uh, then we kind of cut back to Raban. Uh, he's kind of leading a war party out in the desert. Uh, gets his ass handed to him. <laughs> Runs away. Yeah. Again, it's like he he goes out. He's all pissed off. You know, obviously the Fremen and Muad'Dib, like they're destroying all these you know, harvesters and halting production. He wants to be Billy Badass and go out to the desert, and they fire into like a random mountain that maybe they think is a siege. Um, and then uh, they get uh, kind of set upon by the Fremen. They get their asses kicked. He runs. He literally runs. He runs away. Literally runs away right back to his ship, and then this kind of like goes from there. You know what I mean? Come on, Batista. <laughs> I expected more from Dave. So we kind of go back to uh, the princess, Arulan. Uh, Arulan? Yeah. yeah <laughs> uh, she kind of yeah. learns about the plans of the Benny Jesuit from the Reverend Mother. Uh, we kind of get the seeds that Paul is not the only savior prospect in this movie. Yeah. Uh, Fade also- Rotha. Mm-hmm. Fade Rotha hearkening Todd. Yeah, that's... The, the plans here, like, so Princess Arulan, she's like, uh, she's talking about, she's talking to the Reverend Mother, because the Reverend Mother is like, you know, that that's our next prospect. If Paul doesn't pan out, there's also Fade, uh, and, and Arulan's like, you know, he's psychotic, and the Reverend Mother doesn't really care about that. She's just like, can he be controlled? Yeah. So she sends one of her, uh, one of her little minions, one of her little, uh, little birdies out to Getty Prime to kind of see what it would take to kind of... Uh, to to control him how can he be controlled to like gain some insight on him and we see uh on giddy prime we see the he's having a little birthday celebration mm-hmm. i guess it's like his uh, his coming of age i guess so to speak i think he's supposed to be kind of depicted probably like as like a younger kind of hearkening and like he's having kind of a uh to celebrate his birthday they're they're presenting him with like a gladiatorial battle yes. like uh take us through the uh what happens in the arena there on giddy prime so first of all, that whole look of that thing was just like yeah. amazing. That just oh, yeah. like almost washed out, completely like bleached white look. Yeah, it's like got like, a, like <laughs> a, yeah, like a very like monochrome, even brighter kind of monochrome look to it. Yeah, it looks fantastic. So they've kind of got him set up in like a gladiatorial type combat. I think they say he's they got like one of the last three three surviving uh, House of Trades members. Mm-hmm. But uh, you you know, two of them are drugged. You know, he's uh, fade is actually thinking all three are drug, but you know, you know, the Baron kind of slipped him in a little birthday surprise. Yeah, I didn't drug this one for you. Yeah, you yeah, got to yeah. fight this one legit, which exactly. kind of leaves you thinking, you know, how good is fade really? <laughs> yeah, so that's the that's the <laughs> criticism. Like I've seen, you know, I've heard criticism of this scene, which I think actually of the small criticisms I heard about this film is it might be fair, and that the criticism is like if fade is such like a badass like warrior. Why doesn't he fight these three Atreides that are like the prisoners? They're probably already malnourished and not fed well, and like yeah. they're not at their peak performance. Anyway. They looked in rough shape anyway, right? <laughs> like why, if he's such a badass, why does he not like fight them straight out? One, you know, one on three or one v one or whatever have you. If he's supposed to be like this, you know, again, harkening badass. But I think it kind of goes back to like it's it, it like again, that the Harkonnens might be more bark than bite. Again, like how, how they're, they're kind of so, they're, they're kind of so set with their, like, again, their money and their wealth and their power and their influence and their overwhelming forces. That's, that's kind of how you see them. That's how they destroyed the Atreides with overwhelming force with, you know, and it, and it wasn't even mostly their, their uh, troops. It was like the Sardaukar from the emperor. Mm-hmm. Like they did a lot of the dirty work too. So it's like how, like how powerful are the Harkonnens when you really come down to it, like push to shove. And like, I think it's a little bit of a valid criticism. Like if I had to tweak it, I would just like, I would rather fade be like, actually be a badass, like completely it's a complete badass. Yeah. Yeah. And like have no room for any kind of like, you know, conversation about that. Just have him come out and completely desiccate those three. Cause like the last one that's not drugged is kind of like an older man anyway. And it's like, he doesn't have the easiest time against him even without being drugged or anything else. It's not like it's just a complete like pushover. Like yeah. he has a little bit of a trouble with that guy too. So like, I would just rather kind of seen it like kind of go the other way, but I get the criticism, but it doesn't, it's, a nitpick if anything so we kind of go to a scene where the uh i think her name was lady margo mm-hmm. she's the one that was sent by the reverend mother to kind of you know see what it'll take to push fades buttons you know what, what's it going to take to get him in line yeah she's played by leah sadu just want to throw that in there yeah and we kind of you know get the uh inference that fade can be controlled sexually sexually i yes. think they say in the movie he's kind of sexually uh, inferior or not fully developed something, something like along that. those lines mm-hmm. uh, 
uh, Lady Margot actually, uh, you know, she has a sexy time with him and he <laughs> impregnates her with a girl. Called, yes. Other than Paul, Albini Jesuits have to have a female child. Yeah. She also performs that box test on him. Oh, yeah. She was like, stick your hand in the box. Yes. And I'm like, oh, oh, that, that box. That box. You meant, oh, I, <laughs> so, I got you. The, yeah, the I test box. Did you I, want to gob on this Jabbar? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. We had to. We had to. Yeah, she holds the little Gamjabar needle to to his <laughs> neck on that. Yeah, but yeah, she sends him there, and she kind of reports back to the Reverend Mother and to Princess. Uh, that, you know that he can be controlled. That he's another prospect. I've got his bun in the oven. If all else fails, you know, hopefully that'll be another uh, another member to our order, kind of here. And, right. We go back to a rockets and we get Josh Brolin. He he survived the uh, the attack on the Atreides. Uh, we get uh, him as Gurry in uh, like a spice harvester, singing about having piss in his steel suit. Yeah, I guess he's uh, he's with a band of smugglers or just like spice smugglers now. Yeah, so I guess I'm not sure. If, uh, I'm not sure if it's implied if any of them are Atreides or not. If they're just a random other group on a rockets that were already there that maybe were out of Arakeen or something like the capital. But like, yeah, he's working with a group of like spice smugglers uh, since Paul's been like fucking up spice production basically it's driven the price of spice <laughs> spice spice even higher yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he's uh, he's you know making money and trying to basically help them out but yeah uh, Paul and him kind of reunite they, they kind of have that uh, Paul's like you know I heard your footsteps kind of old man kind of oh, thing yeah. and uh, they kind of reunite and it, it's good that they, they reunite it's good that Gurney's alive and it's good that that Paul's alive because Gurney knows where Duke Leto kept the atomic weapons of the Atreides and uh, it's good that Paul's alive because he's the only one with the uh, the fingers to get him in there <laughs> to, to, get, <laughs> yeah, to get him into the door so yeah apparently uh, all the great houses have atomic weapons of some sort and uh, Gurney was privileged to know where Duke Leto kind of hid uh, the atomics for uh, House Atreides and they kind of go and uh, kind of see the atomics I think they say they have like 90 some I think it was like 90 yeah warheads. 92 94 yeah. and there's like a little again little kind of little co comedic little scene where he's like you know how many to have and he's like Gurney's like enough to destroy the planet and still guarding it was like what the fuck <laughs> you destroy the you destroy the planet kind of thing uh, and then they he kind of takes them in Paul kind of opens the door you see all those like kind of missiles and this immediately sends up a big red flag to Chinese like now not only is Paul starting to slowly you know delve into this prophecy stuff but he's also now kind of backed by the ability to have atomic missiles and warheads at his disposal definitely kind of like a big kind of like red flag to Chani I would right. say so from here we kind of cut back to the south and uh, Jessica and she's kind of she's beginning to learn how the water of life is obtained uh, we kind of see this sand pit with like young worms maybe about as long as my arm we see this kind of lady go in and she catches one Immediately takes it over to a pool of water, and I'm like, "What the fuck? Did she catch it to drown it?" <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and she does. Yeah, <laughs> and she does. And she, you know, she sends this kind of device down its throat, and she kind of extracts the blue liquid out. And you know, we learn that the water of life is basically worm poison. Yeah, that's what the water of life is. That's how it, Jessica kind of asked her to demonstrate how it's extracted. Yeah, they just take young worms. She says one at a time because if you put them in together in their little sand pit, they fight and they'll kill each other. But yeah, they just take them one at a time and extract out the poison, and that's. Basically Basically, what the the blue Windex life is yeah. is uh, is worm poison, and like I thought it was again. It's another not sure. I'm I'm assuming that's how it is in the book. I'm not sure. We don't we don't yeah. know. We're not readers. Uh, like uh, you know, like of that. So, but uh, again, it's another little good world building. Like I never really thought about where it came from. Like even back in the Dune '84, like when it was kind of introduced, I never really thought they didn't explain it. They didn't have time. Yeah. You know, somebody could have been like, oh, like in their little you know <laughs> internal monologue. Like, it's a good thing we get this from young worms. Let me drown this worm. <laughs> <laughs> and extract its poison, like kind of thing. Yeah, like, but that's apparently where the the water of uh, of life comes from. Uh, uh, go ahead. We and so, uh, Lady Jessica, she tells that the lady, like, you know, a man's going to come up, and you know, he's going to you going to allow him to drink this water of life. She's like, it'll, it'll kill him. <laughs> She's like, kill it, let him try. Yeah, with that voice, like, do it, let I him try. I love the sound design in this film too. Like the any time that she uses the voice, just the sound design in general, but the the the, the sound design of her using the voice and all that kind of stuff, like it's just fantastic. And like that one time there at the end when Paul uses it, and then it's like booms. Yes. I mean, it's booming. I love that. <laughs> I love that scene. We'll get into that too. But yeah, I love how. He he uses it kind of at the end. Uh, we see another, Paul has that same vision again where it shows him like,
like, you know, following that woman, you know, to if he he follows this person in the South, uh, that it's going to strike up a holy war, you know, millions starving to death in his name. And you kind of see in that version of the vision, it's definitely implied that it's Jessica. You kind of yeah. see more of a profile of her, of her face, and you kind of see that if, if Paul, based on Paul's vision, if he continues to follow his mother and the prophecy that it will... You know, uh, his visions tell him that it will lead to a, a holy war that will leave millions dead from from hunger alone, if not other things. Uh, this is this is something um, I've, I've seen in criticisms as well, because ba- around this point in in uh, the film is where, you know, fades come in. He's kind of been he's you know kind of given a raucous. Yeah. You know, he's fuck Raban. He's he's shit in the bed on the raucous. Let's bring in Fade. Uh you know, uh Harkin and Baron Harkin and gives him control of uh, that. Get Spike Spice Production back, take care of the Fremen. So they car they start like um blasting like Siege Tabor. Like they start like bringing out artillery and striking it. And it's a criticism I've seen and I I, I didn't really uh, you know get to a chance to look into it, but like how did they find him? I was, yeah, how did they know to exactly go to that spot and start bombing? Yeah, because you. it's a big point in the first one is like all those sieges are supposed to be like hidden and damn near undiscoverable. Like it's not shown in the film like how they they learned about where the siege was or anything like mm-hmm. that. I think it would have been maybe if you had a little scene like where maybe they, they end up getting a victory over a group of Fremen and maybe they torture them torture or something. Torture one, yeah. Just something little. Like, maybe there is an explanation. It's possible it's in the book or something. Maybe it's in the film and I didn't really see it and maybe I overlooked it, but other people obviously have had the same thought and I was like kind of wondering because they do, they bomb the shit out of Siege Tabor and like, you know, the Baron is like, you know, remarking, it's like, we're basically melting rock above their head. And like, there's a part of it too where like, I think one of them is like, oh, who'd have thought, you know, using artillery is like, like, you never thought about that before. Right. Like, using like all your, like, you know, your resources and your fucking, you know, artillery that you have at your disposal to use against these people already. They're like, oh, like, they just like, it's an epiphany to them. <laughs> Let's use artillery, you know what I mean? Right. So basically, after the destruction of Siege Tabor, uh, you know, it's, you know, everybody's pretty much resigned to that. You know, they've got to head south. But, you know, Paul, he, he's reluctant to go because, you know, he's had those visions. If he goes south, everything's going to shit. Yes. <laughs> but everybody does go south. They hop a worm train. Yeah. <laughs> That's how everybody gets around. That's how you get from north to hop south. Hop the worm train. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you hop on the worm train. Uh, and Paul kind of, like you said, he kind of splits off. Uh, on his worm train, and he uh, he heads to the little temple to uh, to take the water of life. Uh, and it said too in the prophecy, it said that you know the the, the prophecy says that the the, the mother of the Lisan Agib shall you know shall survive the poison. Uh, it, the poison itself is supposed to be completely, uh, you know, kills any man that drinks it. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it's, you know, a man cannot survive drinking it. So Paul decides that, you know, based on what he's seeing, he knows he has to drink the water alive. He drinks it. Uh, he doesn't die per se. Jessica says that he his his vital signs are so low that they're almost like imperceptible. Um, but to to save Paul, he can only be saved by the uh, the tears of the desert spring, which we kind of learned earlier in the film that uh, Chinese Fadaikin name is. Uh, Desert Spring. Mm-hmm. How convenient! <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that as a bad. We're not thing. knocking it. No, folks, no, no not at all. Trust me. Like I, I fucking love this movie. But yeah, her 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 Fadaki name is Desert Spring. So she takes and mixes uh, a drop of Water of Life with some of her tears, which I think with a little uh, prodding of using Jessica, kind of using the voice on her a little bit to like do it. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Sounding like Emperor Palpatine. Do it uh, <laughs> to make her kind of use. Uh, to uh to kind of bring Paul back to life and uh as soon as Paul kind of comes back Paul is definitely changed. Yeah, you can tell that he is definitely, you know, he's different. He's all he's you know, he's full born this messiah now. He's kind of left that younger, you know, more reluctant hero Paul behind. He's you know, he's got his goal, he's got his mission. It's it's cool. <laughs> yeah, you do you see like just like Jessica taking it, you see a flip and then like when when Paul takes it, you also see a flip. Um I, I want to talk about that a little bit more later. I've got a question for you, but I want to uh pause on Chani for a second because like, you know, the rest of this we're we're definitely firmly basically in our third act of the film now. Um I wanna I've, I've heard criticism of Chani's kind of characterization in this film that there are too many instances of 
her uh, undercutting Paul and the prophecy and kind of the, the Fremen fundamentalist and being like too much of a, uh, a conscientious subjector kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you think about how Chani's depicted in the film? Like, what do you feel about how her, how she's characterized? I mean, I, I didn't see any problem with it. Now, maybe I haven't read as much into it as many people have, but right. I kind of feel, you know, I think she's conflicted. I mean, you know, I think at this point she loves Paul. She, right. I think she was in love with Paul, mm -hmm. but I think she's kind of resided herself or has kind of accepted that, you know, Paul is kind of beyond me now. He is fully this Messiah, you know, whichever version you want it to be, the Bene Gesserit Messiah or, you know, the Fremen Messiah. Right. He's the guy. And, you know, I, I, you know, I've lost him. Yeah. And she's kind of competing with this idea of like, you know, maybe the thing she's seeing maybe is kind of having her question if Paul is more than he appears to be, if, mm -hmm. if he is more than just kind of a man. But then it's also like I think she's conflicted because she holds that belief that these prophecies are just in place to keep people like the Fremen enslaved keep them down to yeah. keep them down and to like you know to not to not um kind of keep them in place so they they don't see the the, the strengths within themselves to kind of to rise up and do better and to kind of take back control of their own planet I thought her characterization was fine I had no problem with how she was depicted I didn't think it was like she was like too whiny or too like I thought it fit the character and I think I fit who she was been set up to be over you know part of the first film and definitely through this film yeah I, thought, I mean she's first and foremost she is a Fremen that right. she will live and die by the Fremen so. right and I think she stays true to that to the end of this yeah for sure um Kind of going back to Paul now, he's kind of awoken after he's kind of had his level up. He tells Jessica, you know, he's able to see now. You know, he can see his his visions clearly. He can see all possible futures. He sees a, a very narrow way through to, to victory for them. He has his kind of Doctor Strange moment. Like right. Before. He's like, we got one shot. We got one shot. this is it. This is it. Um, another another thing, we talked about it last week in our Doom Part 1. It was just some, like, uh, some lore that I had found out just kind of researching is that uh, the Reverend Mother is Jessica's mother. She uh, was impregnated by the Baron, uh, and Jessica is obviously the offspring of the Baron and Reverend the Reverend Mother, which means Paul is Baron Harkonnen's grandson. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his visions, he's able to see now that Jessica is the daughter of Baron Harkonnen, and he is his grandson, and he kind of confronts Jessica with that. And he's like, you know, did, did my father know? And she's like, I didn't know until I took the water of life, you know. So I think that's a Dune Messiah thing. I think that they're, like, kind of pushing forward into this film a right, little bit. Right. But I think it absolutely, when we get to the scene, the next scene, uh, the, the first scene ever that Paul has with the, the Baron, I think it just adds extra layer to it and adds some more weight that just oh, yeah. makes it even more, uh, just makes it, the scene even more like powerful than it already kind of is. But yeah, uh, we see him, like I said, he comes back and he's like completely different. He goes before there's, they've pretty much gathered every friend in there. Like, it, you know, it's, you, you look, there's like a scene, there's like a big circle and like, apparently you're only allowed to outsiders aren't I, allowed to speak in that kind of gathering unless they're uh, a leader, unless they're part of the Fremen. So they, they keep, uh, Stilgar tells them to do it like a couple scenes earlier, but there's like an old man. It's like, oh, you, you can't talk mm -hmm. here unless you kill Stilgar. Yeah. <laughs> and still you can't like, come in here and speak unless you kill me. Of course, Stilgar is like, he's like, I do, do it. Hey, kill, kill like, me, kill man. me. Kill me. I know. I kill me, Muad'Dib. You know, like, what, he's like, he's completely ready to die. He's, he's so far up into Kool Aid now. Yeah, exactly. Like, he, he's drank all the Kool Aid. There's not enough for anyone else. And he's like, yeah, just do it, please. Um, and Paul's like, you know, that makes no sense. Why would I, like, destroy a knife before battle? Like, why would I get rid of, like, you know, the best of us kind of thing? And, yeah. like, he has this moment where he goes into that circle and he's like, there's no one here that can kind of stand against me. And, and they're all of them are, like, just pulling out their, their Chris knives and they're like, oh, we can. We, we can, can stand we against can take you. you. Yeah, oh, we got <laughs> you. But then he kind of picks out one random Fremen among the group and he starts talking to him about, like, his uh, – things he couldn't possibly know unless mm -hmm. he was like the one uh, he starts talking about his grandmother, how she was blinded by like a, I think she took a rock to the face when she was yeah. on the, riding a worm train uh, <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. And like, and the, the friend, that Fremen dude is like, you know, he's like, Oh my D, you know, full, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he's definitely, he's more deep. Like, and they all just kind of like kneel down and uh, he takes out uh, his father's signet ring. He puts that onto his finger and he's like, he's fully now he's Paul, 
you know, Uso, Muad'Dib, Atreides. He's all things in one. Uh, and he announces that he announces himself the Duke of Arrakis. And like, it's, it's a great scene, but it also kind of like, you're also kind of left, at least to me, I don't know about you. It's just also like, Hmm, this, this could go either way. Right. Like this, when someone rises and has this much power, this fast, how how much does power kind of corrupt that? Uh, so like, they always say, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Hey, absolutely, <laughs> exactly. So you're kind of left to wonder that, but it's like it's a fantastic scene. Like I I love the scene. We also uh, learn that when he's talking to that um that random Freeman guy, that uh, the original name of the that uh, the his I guess his grandmother was around when the planet had a Fremen name, and he says the name of the planet was Dune. Didn't you say something to me about that? Where you're like, I never knew that that's where the word Dune you came thought from. It was the sand dunes. I thought it was sand dunes. There's <laughs> I mean, sand dunes all over the place. That's a valid. That's a that's a that's a valid uh, that's a valid point. I would say, like I, I you know I didn't know it was called Dune for like you know had that, that was the actual name of the planet. I pretty much I never really thought about it, but I think if I would have thought about it, I would probably I would probably been like, yeah, it's just some, some sand dunes, right? It's all that's, sand that's dunes, called, man. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one more thing before we move on, like. Um, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's a valid question or not, but do you think Paul is Paul really changed? Like, is this as the water of life really changed him, like in such a profound way that it's changed his personality to where he's like that guy now, where he's like I'm the Duke of Arrakis, like I'm there's nobody better than me, nobody can challenge me, or is that how how he now knows he must act to make his way through, as he says? What do you think? Is it is he really changed, or is that how he is, or is that the the person he knows he has to play based on what he's seen to get to point A to point B? I th- I really think it's just you know he's finally accepted that you know this is his fate, and for him to get these people where he needs to get them, this is the way he must portray himself and how he must appear to these people now. Right, because Jessica at one point says you know you tells him your father didn't believe in your revenge, and he's like yeah, but I do. Like, you know, kind of thing. And I think he's just, like, so focused on his goal, like, to, to destroy the Baron, to, you know, to uh, to get revenge for his family and his father that he's, like, so set on that. Like, he'll use whatever means. And I think I think that's a means to an end, really. I don't yeah. think he's completely changed that way, but he may. And we'll kind of talk about that a, a little bit, uh, you know, as we kind of go forward. But um, uh, let's let's – Pick up back to the story here. So we kind of, uh, Paul kind of gets the word to the emperor, like, hey, motherfucker, <laughs> I got you spice. I got you planted Arrakis. Yeah, exactly. Come on down here and take it from me. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we see, too, the princess of Rulon. She, uh, she kind of uh, corners the reverend mother, and she's like, you know, um, did you convince my father to destroy the Atreides and she's like of course I did like why you know why wouldn't why would he have done it without you know the council for me like she she says the Bene Gesserit kind of felt that the Atreides had become their bloodline had become too dangerous and too hard to kind of control and she's the one that kind of set the things in motion anyway like this is kind of all coming from the Reverend Mother which is kind of something else that kind of adds to that um overall like you know the things we've seen from from Dune part one all the way to now is like why was it just the emperor being insecure? But no, it's a little bit more than that. It's again the Benny Jezer planting and always planting and you know puppeting, I guess basically. Yeah, trying to like weave the strings of uh, everything together under their control, yeah. going their way. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we see the emperor, him and his legions come down in a big Saiyan pod. <laughs> yeah, it was like, like a, a space almost pod. like a glass eyeball. Exactly. I, I mean, it looks cool. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you know, not to drop in something here, but, you know, the look of everything in these movies was just it's very unique. Mm-hmm. It's very, sci- it's sci- you know, sci-fi, of course, right. but, you know, it's just everything from, you know, the copters. I'll just call them copters because I can't say <laughs> ornithopters. <laughs> and you just said it. There and I said good. it wrong again. No, you said it right. Did you said I? it right. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, the weapons, the ships, the technology, it's just, I mean, I, you know, it all has that, like yeah. I said, I think I said before, like it has a... It's almost a sterile look, very sterile, very it is. cold. It's very simple. Yeah. It's very, yeah, it is very cold, but it's also like, which kind of lends itself to the realism. And it's like, I don't know, 
like you know, kind of like there's things like Lord of the Rings where there's people like Alan Lee and like all these illustrators that have like kind of illustrated that world and uh, you know over the years that kind of were borrowed for the filming and of that film and all that kind of you know the three Lord of the Rings films. I don't know how much that has been done for Dune or how much this is just the design by, of the production team behind this yeah. film. But whichever it is, kudos because like yeah. you know, the ornithopters, the way the ship looks. I mean, from the Emperor ships to the ships that the Atreides use, the Harkin like the spice harvesters like you kind of see them more in depth you see their little like they got like i don't know like little fingers or legs or like you know into the ground it's like kicking up the sand like so it can be like extract the spice can be extracted it's like it's kind of thought out and like i mean obviously we said this is kind of a thinking man sci-fi this is deep Mm sci-fi and there's a lot more craziness and there's a lot more deep stuff to this book that this film never goes into and never touches and probably never will and from what i understand it gets much more crazy and like doom messiah and yeah like the books that follow like your paul becomes like god emperor of like dune and he becomes like one of those testicles and all this kind of stuff oh, like, what <laughs> yeah major spoilers for on on down the line <laughs> Uh, you know, I always thought those, I just, I don't, just someone will throw this in just because I thought it was interesting. You know, we talked about the testicles from Dune 84. Uh, you know, apparently they're kind of like the closest thing to like, I guess, aliens in that, in this universe. True. But they're not really aliens. They're, they're people that have had uh, so much exposure to spikes that it's changed them to, to be like that. So like they're, they're not like completely like alien or anything like that. They're like. Uh, they've absorbed so much spice that it's changed them into that testicles testicles exactly. don't do drugs <laughs> <laughs> don't do drugs exactly <laughs> um so uh where are we at here now todd uh we've got pretty much paul the, again their emperors is, is landed the paul and the fremen kind of launched their attack uh on the emperor and the the harkonnen inside uh at the uh, the emperor's uh, kind of uh, inside where he and his, and his daughter and everyone else is and, and the Harkonnen and you've got Fade, Baron Harkonnen. He has one of his Sardaukar kind of immobilize the Baron, kind of like, he's got this like, I don't know what those little bag things are with him during the film. I Kind of cuts him free from those, yeah. I assume it's something like that he now needs after like the, he absorbed some of that poison from Duke Leto. Yeah. Because he didn't have it before. So I'm assuming it's something like that. Part of his like maybe healing process because he's still taking his motor oil bath. Yeah. <laughs> as we see in the film. Yeah. Uh, when when fate is pissed off at him at one point for like you're not drugging that third guy and he's like, I don't drown during that bath kind of thing. Like yeah. he's still taking his motor oil bath. But he cuts him free for that and he also like hits I guess one of some of his like implants at the back of his head which I guess kind of completely kind of immobilizes mm-hmm. him but uh tech, I wanted to kind of ask you like again here's another little criticism I've heard from people uh, okay. it's about Christopher Walken uh-huh. and his his casting in the film and his performance in the film um not, not to even go any deeper than that what what did you just think of the, his performance in the film you know you've kind of you kind of got to the point with Christopher Walken where you know, is he almost become a character of himself? And I mean, I don't think it's of his own doing, but it's like, you know, who out there doesn't do a Christopher Walken voice anymore? It right. seems like. I think, I think it was even a Super Bowl commercial this year mocking him some way like that. I don't remember what it was for. Like right. everybody was doing a Christopher Walken mm-hmm. voice. But I don't think he does anything to me that detracts from his portrayal of the Emperor. I mean, of course you're like, oh, it's Christopher Walken. Right. But uh, he doesn't do or say or delivery kind of lines, you know, you know, weird or goofy way. Yeah, I think that's the kind of the criticism I heard is like is not as valid to me because I think it's exactly like you explained. It's like I think their criticism is that it's 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 just that it is Christopher Walken and mm-hmm. it he is such a, a character unto himself that I think people are distracted by it. But for me, I mean, I knew obviously he was in the film. I didn't think I, from what I, from my, what I've read, he was a, he was a fan of the book. He read it as a child and mm-hmm. it, was, it was something he wanted to be involved with this film kind of thing. And like I said, there's nothing he does to dis- distract him. Yes. Does he, even when he's not trying to be the Christopher Walken, we know he mm-hmm. still sounds like Christopher Walken, obviously. Yeah. But there's nothing that I was like, oh, like, you know, it doesn't distract me or take away from the experience at all. It's like, yeah. Paul, hey, Paul, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. You know, I mean, he's not picking up the scenery and just chewing the shit out yeah. of it. He's, you know, he's delivering his lines and I thought right. he delivered them well. Right. Like, you see this watch, Paul? <laughs> your father had this up his ass. <laughs> like, it's none of, it's none of <laughs> 
he knows there's no don't get none he of don't that. know that stuff like you know what i mean like it's i think it's fine but again i've heard i've heard criticism of chani i've heard criticism of you know christopher walken's kind of performance in this but i thought it was fine i didn't think he's not in it very much most of the time you just see him he's not even talking uh i think uh you know florence Pugh plays princess rulon she kind of remarks too that since you know he 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 pulled the trigger on killing the trade he's not really been the same yeah he's kind of maybe regretting it maybe maybe or just feels the weight of feels the weight of what he's done of his actions but i mean i just wanted to kind of throw that in there because i heard some uh, kind of criticisms of that as we kind of went so from there, I think we finally get our Gurney Raban showdown. <laughs> yes, <laughs> nice. Yeah, so Gurney's wanting revenge against Raban for uh, for giving him a scar and obviously for killing his friends and his family. So Gurney kind of gets his his um, his revenge against Raban there. And the, the the fights outside, you know, obviously Paul the Fremen, uh, they launch originally they launch an atomic missile because like they're. The way that they're positioned in the ship, they're like kind of. I think there's a storm or something, like a dust storm, and, and like they say yeah. that they have cover from the mountains. And so Paul, they use the atomics to kind of blast the mountain range yeah. to let the storm through, and it also kind of disrupts the shields of the the emperor's ship. And you know, Paul, the Freeman, they all come in riding on the worms, like it's like a trailer shot. It's like amazing, you know. It's like. Um, you know, I wasn't expecting like a big fight. Like I wasn't expecting like a big, like, you know, long lengthy battle. No, I wasn't expecting, I knew we were getting like, we're already pushing close to three hours. I knew we were getting, (laughs) by the time that scene happens, I knew we were in the home stretch. Like I wasn't expecting like, you know, some kind of battle at Minas Tirith, like kind of level of fight there. And like, I feel like we get just enough of the fight outside. It doesn't go on too long. You see some cool stuff. You see the worms, you know, it's not really even a fight. It's a massacre, really. Pretty much, yeah. It's desert power. Like his father said to harvest, he's harvested it to its full capacity. And it's not It's not a fight. It's really just a massacre of the Harkin and the Sardaukar. It's, it's not really a fight. So why would it drag on? Yeah, why would you linger? I think it's better that it's just a massacre. And it's not like, oh, we're just clanging swords for 20 minutes. Yeah, like yeah. cutting back and forth and doing some like prequel bullshit, like Star Wars prequels. Like, well, we got to have four battles running it simultaneously. Like, right. No, just massacre them. And then let's move on. And that's kind of what it does. And it just like kind of plays perfectly. Um, But Paul and the Freeman, they kind of breached the Emperor's ship. Uh, We kind of see it's kind of like Sandy, kind of, you know, kind of their view of the Emperor and his view of who's coming in is kind of obscure. Mm -hmm. They send some troops in. They immediately get killed. You kind of see Paul walking in. There's no, nobody says a word. Paul walks in, goes straight to the uh, to uh, the Baron who's laying on the ground. He picks him up from like the back of the head. And he's like grandfather, stems him right in the neck. Yeah, and it was like the most <laughs> satisfying fucking scene. Mm. And he also says too. He also says like you die like an animal. And I'm like, this is fucking badass. Oh yeah. I'm like, this whole movie is just fucking badass. Like it's like such a great film, and like it's you, it's such a cathartic moment where he just and it's again, there's no music. There's no one saying shit. There's no, like, you know, nothing else happening but just Paul in that moment stabbing the Baron right in his little meaty neck. <laughs> like, and it's just, it's perfect. It works perfectly. It works perfectly. And everybody's just like, well, you know, <laughs> they just, they're just left to kind of look in awe. He tells the Fremen to, like, um, take the prisoners to, you know, wherever he, he tells them to, to take them and to just kill the Sardaukar. And I love that he's just like, kill the Sardaukar. Yeah. No, no quarter, no prisoners for them. They, kill them. Yeah, just kill them. Kill them. Exactly. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's just like a fantastic scene. He also says to leave the Baron's body for the desert, apparently left for the ants, because that's the next time we see, the last time we see the Baron. He's covered just, in ants. He's just covered, he's just covered in ants. So I think from there we finally get our showdown with the Emperor and mm-hmm. Paul. And uh, the emperor kind of, you know, just like, you know, do you know why I had to take down your father? You know, your father was a man of heart. Uh, you know, you, you can't be an effective leader like that. You know, your father was nothing as a leader, yeah. basically along those he lines. Was weak. He was a weak leader. You know, I'm expecting Paul to just, you know, fuck him up royally <laughs> after saying that. Right. It's what my inner child wanted. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, the great houses also, they've, they've signaled the great houses to come to to uh, this massacre, basically, of, uh, of the emperor and his forces. So the great houses are kind of orbiting above. Uh, he tells Gurney to send a message to the great houses if any of them attack or intervene, that they'll use the atomics to completely obliterate every spice field on the planet um, so they don't take any action. He, uh, 
he basically tells the emperor, um, you know, to stand and fight or to pick his champion. Uh-oh. And, and of course, <laughs> of course, Fade steps up because, like, he's seeing. There's like a lot of little really good moments too. Like, there's a part when I, uh, when when Paul's kind of walking in and he kind of stabs the bear, and there's like a there's a little quick cutaway to like Fade, and he's like. Like, yeah, like you know, he's like this. This guy's mean some business. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm interested in maybe fighting this guy. Um, so he volunteers to be um, uh, Paul or uh, the Emperor's champion. Uh, and Paul and Fate have their fight, and the, you get the kind of the trailer line where it's like you know, may thy knife chip and shatter. And uh, Fate says it back to him in like a kind of a condescending way. It's like may thy knife chip and shatter. You right, know, that kind of thing. I really like the look of Fate too. Like, does he have teeth? <laughs> it's hard to tell if it's like a mouthpiece. I think they're all black, maybe. Or no something. eyebrows whatsoever. Uh, yeah, all of them are bald with no eyebrows and everything. Austin yeah. Butler was Fade, by the way. Amazing actor, yeah, I think. Yeah, I don't know if I've seen Austin Butler in anything. Yes, I know he was Elvis, and I know he's going to be in like a, there's like a new movie where he's in where he's like a motorcycle guy. And uh, there's like a new show that he's on, uh, something. It's like a, about like aviation, like, you know. Yeah, it's on Apple Plus. I can't think of the name of it right yeah. now. It's World War Two era. Right, yeah. Like, um, but like I, I know he's like he's he's a good actor and he does a really great job in this and there's been like a lot made about like, behind the scenes about like, you know, how he was on set and improvising the whole like running the knife down his tongue and that kind of stuff. Like I mean he does a he does a great job. At first when I first heard him speak, I was like, Is he doing like a Harkin and meets Elvis thing here? But as <laughs> as he speaks more, it sounds like he's trying to kind of be he almost sounds like a he's like he's doing kind of an imitation and not using not saying imitation in a negative way, but like almost like evoking like a younger sounding Stellan Skarsgård. Like he does kind of sound like a younger version of the Baron. I didn't catch that, but that's just cool. And, uh, you know, but he, his, his performance is great. So him and Paul have their fight and uh, it's not too long. It's about maybe five minutes. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe not even that. It's, it's not a, it's not a long fight. It's 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 well done. Um, Paul eventually, you know, he kind of, he gets a little bit roughed up. You know, like yeah. you see him, he's like, he's like bleeding from the head. You know, fate is not a pushover, even though he's not, you know, he was, <laughs> had to kill like an old man and two drug guys in the gladiatorial arena. You see, he's not a pushover. He can hold his own. He can, he can hold his own. Uh, him and Paul, him and Paul are kind of fighting and, uh, Paul basically wins by, um, Using the, the uh, a technique of basically mutually assured destruction in a way, and it kind of goes back to the scene at the end, uh, not the end, but a scene in Dune Part One where Gurney takes over Paul's training, and it's basically like you know you've you've got me, I've got you type thing. Yeah. But unlucky for Fade, he doesn't strike a fatal blow against Paul. He kind of like gets him in the stomach, and Paul kind of gets him, I guess, under the ribs near the heart, kind of a little bit. And it's kind of one of those things like he, that's kind of how he like tricks him and pulls him in is to kind of use that kind of mutually assured destruction and like i just kind of liked it because it was kind of a call back to to dune one something that yeah. something that you you should not do but maybe the only way paul knew that he could defeat fate in battle was to kind of go that way with it i guess and what is say. it he says he says we'll fall to trades something like before that. he dies yeah, yeah something like badass. that i mean it is yeah it's absolutely it's absolutely a badass like fight scene uh my only uh we don't, uh, you know, something I'll mention here from uh, Dune 84 compared to this, there is no Dune 84. But well, basically in the book, there's something called the Weirding Way, which is kind of like a martial arts style using the voice. In in uh, 84, uh, David Lynch thought that was too dumb to have martial arts on the Dune, so they invented the Weirding Modules, which are a way to like kind of channel your voice into a weapon, mm-hmm. which is uh, even dumber, I think. <laughs> uh, and we get a lot of that stuff that you know that uh, in the Dune 84 with that choksa, you know, <laughs> and they blow stuff up. So th- there is one cooler thing I think in the Fade Fight in the Dune 84 that I will give it that is a little bit bit cooler than what you get in this is uh paul cracking open fade at the end of dune 84 with the voice that is kind of cool that was cool yeah uh so after the fight kind of paul goes back to the emperor and uh you know he's still uh you know he's still looking for a, a life debt there uh you know a life to be paid for it still he's still not happy um he kind of mentioned before that he would he would be willing to take the hand of his daughter of the princess. And I'm like, dude, Johnny's right there. <laughs> yes. Dude. And that's something to mention too before the fight. And that's kind of why I was asking you too before about do you think Paul is really, this is his new personality and this is who he really is or is he just a means to an end? Because he has a little moment with Johnny where he like, he goes to her and he seems like the old Paul where he's like, I'll love you 
and like you know as long as I breathe, mm-hmm. and it's almost like you know he knows what he's got to do, and he's no he knows he can't he has to ask for the princess's hand, but it's all it's almost like he has a little moment where like he he shows the you know the who he really is, who yeah. maybe the character he's 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 not playing the character in that moment. He's you know telling Shining like I love you, um, as long as I breathe, and they have their little moment, and he offers once to to marry the princess. And then after he's after he defeats fate, he kind of goes back to the emperor, and she's like, you know, a life has been taken, a life that has been paid. I'll willingly be your bride if you spare my father. And he kind of agrees to it. He sticks out his hand for like the duke or uh, the emperor to kiss uh, the duke's ring, and he doesn't do it for a moment. As it has a little part where he like stomps his foot, really loud, yeah, badass. To, like, yes. <laughs> also, too, we should mention the Reverend Mother. She uh, she tries to like uh, keep Paul from talking at one point, and like that's what he. Were you talking? He about lets go of that booming voice. Yeah, he's I like, mean, Silence. that's loud. Yes. And then, like, she kind of taken back. She's like, a son of a bitch. She's like, <laughs> she's like abomination. Yeah. And um, there's a moment, too, between the Reverend Mother and Jessica that's, like, really a good, like, uh, like a good little cathartic scene because she has her kind of, she gets to kind of one up the, the Reverend Mother. There's a part where they're communicating telepathically, and Jessica's like, you know, you should have believed. And it's like, she's like, you know, it wasn't the Reverend Mother's like, you know, it was never about belief. And she's like, I think she's like, congratulations or something like that and yeah. she's like reverend mother like calling like the basically jessica now is the new reverend mother that she's best at her and like it's just very uh very satisfying because like i fucking hate the reverend mother <laughs> we also don't get the that cringy line from dune 84 like do you remember like there's that part in it where paul uses the voice on oh no it's it's uh it's paul's little sister who in this film isn't born yeah, she she's not. He has born. a vision of her as an adult, played by Anya Taylor Joy. Right, we should mention he has a little flash, a little flash forward to her. But she is unborn in this. Yeah, film. she is unborn. But there's that part in Dune eighty four where um, uh, the little girl, his sister, comes in and she's like waiting for the Baron, and she's like messing with the Reverend Mother's mind. And she's like, get out of my mind. <laughs> like we don't get that, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, all, all like super good stuff. But, uh, the, the princess agrees to marry Paul. And, uh, at that point, Gurney's like, you know, the, the houses have responded. Uh, they, they, uh, do not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They do not, uh, accept your ascendancy mm-hmm. basically to, uh, emperor or to, uh, Duke of Arrakis or whatever you would say. And, uh, the Fremen, they kind of ask, you know, what do we do? And Paul says, let's lead them to paradise, meaning we're about to go to war. And that's the kind of the last, um, a couple of scenes there, you get Jessica kind of speaking to her unborn child, and she says, you know, your brother attacks the great houses, a holy war begins, and that's definitely our setup for a potential Dune Part 3, a yep. Dune Messiah that I hope to God that we get. Please, go watch this film, people. I've never <laughs> wanted a movie so much as to continue this franchise. And our final shot of the film is, uh, it's of Chani, and she's about to take a, she's about to get on the worm train, she's about to head somewhere, she's, she's seeing that, you know, Know, Paul's changed. Prophecy's kind of been fulfilled. He's marrying the princess. And uh, you kind of see her turning from like sad to like kind of a determined look on her face. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of uh, our last scene of the film. And uh, so ends one of the best science fiction films ever made. Yep. And uh, I dare say one of the best films ever made, Todd. Good stuff. Um, let's go into a couple of questions here. I know we're running long, but there's a lot to unpack here. Hot seat time. Hot seat, seat time. <laughs> um, uh, this is just, I, this is just kind of spitballing here, but any chance that Paul isn't the one and a large portion of everything that happens is largely coincidental. Nah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I feel like there's some, that boy's been through too much not to be the one. I feel like there's some things that you could say that maybe it leaves it open that like it might be, but I I tend to agree with you. I think it's one it, of those open to interpretation. I type think deals. so. I think so. Um, in this too, um, I think you know from some of the, the stuff I understand about how Doom Messiah goes and some of the later books, um, and I think it's kind of not hinted, but you kind of see the seed sown here, like I said, of the way Paul changes and the power and the influence he's gaining and like, will it always be used for good? And like, from my understanding, I don't think that it is. And I think really in the grand scheme of things, like Dune is a story where, um, you know, the good guy winning might be the worst thing that ever happens Ah. from the way I understand like some things go in the story. And I find that 
super interesting. And I've heard people talk about Doom Messiah, that it, it is not, Doom Messiah does not have a, a, a cinematic, fan friendly kind of ending. Oh. But I'm all for that. I, I don't. I, I, I don't would like to see it. Yeah, I, I don't want to see how it unfolds. Yeah, I don't need a happy ending. Like I don't need everything to like wrap up. And I don't. This has a satisfying ending, but is it is it a happy ending? No, no. And it, I think it ends perfectly. Um, but like I, I don't need like a happy cinematic. Paul wins and he gets Shawnee back and all this kind of bullshit and like everything's happy and they they're kissing the at the end and fireworks is going yeah, off the holy know. war doesn't happen and, it, and it's averted like I'm okay with characters being I don't need uh, black and white I'm alright with gray characters or, or people dipping into like you know means to an end type stuff I think it's better storytelling right. so like I think it's a, a crazy not a crazy idea but I think it's a very um neat idea that the, you know the good guy winning in this case might be the worst thing that could happen to the universe and that's just very interesting i think to explore my last question here todd before we move on to uh to uh, final thoughts and our, our scores uh big picture question big picture big picture if doom messiah is made and released and let's say it's as good as part one but not as good as part two because i think we both agree without our scores this is better than part one yeah um Will that trilogy be crowned the best science fiction trilogy of all time in your mind at that point? Overtaking what I would probably guess is Star Wars, in your opinion, the original trilogy. Ooh. Would that, if that if Doom Messiah comes out and it's just as good as part one, but maybe doesn't live up to part two, will that will that supplant Star Wars as the, the best science fiction trilogy of all time? You know, as I sit here today, I would honestly have to say it's going to give it a hell of a run. Because, I, you know, I think where we are now with Star Wars, where that property is kind of getting a little bit diluted with some right. inferior stuff. Right. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I'm one of those people that can watch the original Star Wars trilogy, and I'm like, hey, that was a great three and films. Just be done. Wash my hands of it. I don't right. have to know any of that other stuff. Right. But, you know, Star Wars is a little, you know, in my doghouse right now. So. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, obviously, it's a complicated question. They're two different franchises. Yeah. Uh, Star Wars is a science fiction fantasy type of film. Where yeah. I would say this is more this is science fiction compared to Star Wars science fantasy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if Dune sticks the landing, because I don't feel like the original trilogy stuck the landing with Jedi as much. Yeah, Jedi. You I see like the Jedi. seeds of the shit that Lucas would pull ten years later mm -hmm. with the prequels, with like. Uh, characters not having anything to do, like Han Solo doesn't have shit to do in that movie. Neither yeah. does Leia. Han stands in front of a door for forty five minutes at the end of it <laughs> right. after they rescue, and he has nothing to do. Yeah, and you know, uh, bringing in the Ewoks and the cutesy kind of stuff, mm -hmm. it doesn't stick the landing. Uh, obviously, the first one is good. I think we both agree Empire's better. Oh, yeah. And that's kind of how this is going. The first one is solid. It's tracking. It's tracking. Empire was better. <laughs> Doom Part 2 was better. And if 3 can stick the landing, I think, to me, I'll give it to it. Because, like, you know, I love Empire Strikes Back. Don't get me wrong. I'm like, we'll probably catch hell for just this. Just even even contemplating right. this, this heresy to some people. <laughs> but, like, if you look at it holistically, like, and it sticks the landing, like, there's not much better than this, like in right. ways of sci-fi and especially sci-fi trilogies. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, Denis has given us um, probably two of my favorite science fiction films and two of my favorite films of all time. And one of them is this and the other is Blade Runner 2049, which we'll cover someday, hopefully in the near future. Like okay. I just love both of these and I think yeah. they're like fantastic examples of like elevating that genre and to, to even, even further, uh, you know, kind of, elevating that than what it what it has been over the last few years which is kind of run-of-the-mill stuff that you you know it's all right but nothing special yeah uh todd ready to go on to our reviews let's do it uh we rank films on a one to ten scale starting from one the ranks are torture two awful three bad four subpar five mediocre six decent seven good eight great nine amazing and ten masterpiece todd give us your final thoughts and review score for dune part two you know, if you uh, take me back about four weeks ago, maybe three weeks tops, I, I knew nothing about this series. I, I have not read any of the books, obviously, but I knew nothing about Dune, period. 
I knew earlier, I think it was later last year, we did like our most anticipated films of this year. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I put Dune 2, but I know it wasn't really high. Cause oh, yeah. I need, to go back, <laughs> I need to go back and watch that and, and uh, figure out where we ranked it. Because I feel like it was your probably most anticipated, more close. I think it or Deadpool, yeah. I think. I think maybe uh, mm -hmm. one of those two were uh, pretty high for me, yeah. And now uh, sitting here after watching, you know, the original 84 and these two uh, – I, I really, really want to see a part through this. Uh, I have been blown away by this new series. Uh, if this film doesn't at least sweep all the technical awards at the next Oscar, I will be disappointed. Uh, costume design, sound, uh, all that stuff. I think the director should be nominated. I think the film should be nominated. Honestly, I, th I mean, yeah, you're always in that weird area where like sometimes people don't look at these films as how. Right. But I would argue that they are, to pull off something like this takes more skill than making a, you know, just a straight out and out drama that you can make for $10 million. This is, this gives you the, a level of drama, but also I think this is a budget of like a $190 million film to pull it off and be like this. And this is not just some like big, bombastic, dumb popcorn movie. True. Like this has a story. This is like depthful and insightful and has themes and it makes you think and it has, you know, high highs and low lows in terms of how you feel about what happens to the characters and where they started, where the versus where they were and where they might go. Yeah, like absolutely this is not just some big dumb comic book film or like science right. fiction film this should be looked at like like you know uh like hopefully like a godzilla minus one will be like this exactly like an artful <clears throat> film that's well made it's well crafted it's made by someone who's passionate and i think made by a director who i think is probably the best director working today yeah i would definitely say that after watching this and watching one other film we're going to cover here in a little bit uh this is a director that whenever i hear he's putting up something out i'm going to watch it now mm-hmm and, uh, you know, to put a big old bow on it, I'm going to give Dune Part 2 a 9. This is an amazing movie. Uh, don't put this movie in a box just because it's a sci-fi movie. Right. Don't put Godzilla minus one in a box because it's a monster movie. Right. Those two movies are amazing films that should be judged as amazing films. Give them their due when the time comes. This is an amazing movie. It's a 9 for me. Yeah, I, I would really love uh, if we have the opportunity somehow. I would really love to go back and give this a second watch. Honestly, like I yeah. would, I would be willing to go back and pay money again to see this. Like I said, it is, it is the highest form of this genre. It is a great film in its own right, and hopefully, if if it doesn't get a part three, if we don't see Messiah, that will be criminal a criminal injustice to do to film exactly making like this should, <clears throat> this should get a part three this should make a billion dollars if something like avatar 2 the way of water <laughs> can make a billion dollars right this should make a billion fucking dollars like this is this is one of my favorite films it will be hard to top this as i it would be hard for anything to come out this year and be better and like take my top spot. Like this has my top spot. It's hard to see anything coming out and, and knocking this out of my number one movie already of the year. And yep. we're, we're barely in March. Like we, this is March 2nd as we're recording this today. So for me, I really debated, is this a nine or a 10? Is this a nine or a 10? And I've seen a lot of that. And I don't, I don't have anything that I could say that doesn't make it a 10 for me. Gotcha. What is it about this that I would change? Nothing. We had a little, we talked about some criticisms other people levied against the film that I don't think are really valid. I think everything about it, like, again, I felt like this is a movie that was like an experience. It's one of those things, like, if you didn't see it in IMAX and you didn't go out and, like, see it in a big format and, like, you know, get the, the sound and the ambiance and everything. I feel like it's one of those films that you'll feel like you missed out on an experience right. at the movies. So for me, I, I can't find any reason not to give it a 10 out of 10. I think it's the only time, my second 10 I've ever given. So for me, Doom Part 2 is, is uh, gets a 10 out of 10, which ranks it as a masterpiece. Nice. Uh, it's all I tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media. We are at Tau Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tau Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at TauCapesPod at gmail.com. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Be on the lookout for this week's Popcorn Mumbles. We'll be discussing the 2013 film Prisoners. Tau Capes will return next week. We want to thank you so much for watching. Until next time, bye, guys. See you, guys. <laughs>